The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Breaking Down Barriers to Treatment Adherence and Persistence in Hormone Receptor Positive, HER2 Negative Early Breast Cancer. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at peerview.com forward slash VMP860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Welcome to our program today where we're going to be focused on breaking down barriers to treatment adherence and persistence in hormone receptor positive HER2 negative early breast cancer with a focus on strategies for improved adverse event monitoring and management treatment and plan modifications as well as shared decision making. My name is Sarah Tulaney and I'm a breast medical oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and I am joined by one of my outstanding colleagues, Dr. Uh, Dr. Elihe Salehi. So Elihe, I don't know if you mind introducing yourself to our group today. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yes, my name is Elihe Salehi. I'm a nurse practitioner working in breast oncology, have been at Dana-Farber, um, taking care of breast cancer patients for over 13 years. Well, thanks so much for, for joining me today in this uh, discussion. Um, so I thought before we get into a lot of the management, I thought it's important to frame that discussion with the data that's available to us today for how we actually manage our early stage hormone receptor positive breast cancer patients. We know that we have several endocrine therapies available to us for these patients, including things like tamoxifen, aromatase inhibition, ovarian suppression, as well as strategies to improve outcomes by extending duration of adjuvant therapy. But despite this, we are still left with patients, unfortunately, who do have significant risk of recurrence. We try to identify those patients who may be at high risk by thinking about their clinical pathologic risk, so looking at tumor size, nodal involvement, grade. But we also have the advantage of having genomic panels available to us, which not only help us better understand prognosis, but have provided predictive information about which patients can benefit from systemic chemotherapy. This has really helped us understand risk. But despite the availability of these great risk tools, as well as the availability of endocrine therapy, we unfortunately do see patients who recur to our adjuvant systemic therapies, where we can see patients who have endocrine refractory disease who recur quite early in the course of their adjuvant endocrine treatment. And so I think that's quite important to realize that there are patients who are at risk for recurrence, where we know about 30 to 40 percent of our hormone receptor positive early breast cancer patients can recur. And there's been a big stress on thinking about ways to improve those outcomes. We've seen in the metastatic setting that CDK4-6 inhibition can help patients do better with extending disease control and survival in the metastatic setting. And there was a lot of interest in seeing if CDK4-6 inhibition could also help prevent recurrence in their early disease setting. And we'll review some of the data for abemaciclib in this setting. But knowing that this agent has had benefit, it is important to think about ways that we can improve treatment adherence and persistence in our patients. And so a lot of our discussion today will focus on this and we can think about uh, ways to, to do better. Uh, but I'll turn to Elihe for a question here is, you know, what gaps do you think there are that are really affecting our ability to help our patients with these new therapeutic advances? I think that one of the most important factor in these settings is education and expectations. Um, I think we need to follow patients um, after even starting medications such as CDK4 inhibitors because of their side effects. And we should not only focus on patients, but also their families as well, involving families um, to better understand what side effects and how to manage this. Um, the third thing I would say is a cultural aspect. We sometimes forget to admit, to focus on cultural aspect of every single patient. Every culture is different in regard to taking medications and how to take care of those side effects. So if we look at the holistic view of how to manage these symptoms, I think we will have a better access of uh, patients making sure that they are taking the medication and adhere with this medication taking. Oh, thanks, Elhe. I think those are all excellent points and, and really so critical to not just 
think about the patient themselves, but their family and uh, cultural influences that can have such a, a big impact on uh, adherence. So we'll really start off initially by digging into some of the uh, new data uh, that has emerged from the Adjuvant Monarch E study. And so this trial was specifically focused on very high risk, early stage hormone receptor positive breast cancer patients. So patients, in order to be eligible for this trial, had to have four or more positive axillary lymph nodes or have one to three positive nodes with an additional high risk feature. So they could have had a tumor that was grade three or a tumor that was greater than or equal to five centimeters if they had one to three nodes involved. There was also a separate cohort, cohort two, for those patients who had one to three positive nodes but didn't meet one of those high-risk feature criteria by size or grade, but rather met it by having a high centrally confirmed KI-67 defined as greater than or equal to 20%. And so patients in this study were randomized to get endocrine therapy as per their physician's choice with or without two years of adjuvant abemacyclib. And so the abemacyclib was for the only the first two years of that adjuvant endocrine therapy regimen. And if you look at the patients that enrolled in this study, you can see that it again was a, a high risk group where you see that about 60% of patients in the study actually had four or more positive nodes involved. And when they went back and actually tried to centrally test all patients for KI-67, you can see that almost half the patients had a KI-67 greater than or equal to 20%. Uh, but remember, KI-67 was only required for eligibility within cohort two. When we look at outcomes across the intent to treat population, we do see that the use of adjuvant abemacyclib really helped prevent recurrence. So you see that there was about a 30% reduction uh, in invasive disease-free survival events, where you could see an absolute difference between the two arms at three years of about 5%. So I think a, a clinically meaningful difference that was seen at that follow-up time point. And what's important to realize is that that benefit was really seen across all the important subgroups. So whether you had one to three positive nodes or over four positive nodes, or you had a bigger tumor or a smaller tumor, um, you can see again benefit was seen across all of these subgroups. When we look at distant relapse-free survival, I think that's also really critical because I think what we're really focused on is, in, is helping prevent those distant events. And you can see that that's what the majority of events were, where you see in fact there's a 31% reduction in risk of developing a, a distant uh, recurrence. And you can see that absolute difference was about 4% between the two arms. And so while we, at this point in time, we have about 27 months of follow-up on the Monarchy e study, I think one of the concerns that was raised is, is this benefit going to go away with longer follow-up? Because these patients got two years of therapy. And so as we get further out from their abemacyclib, is it possible that that risk reduction that we're seeing may get smaller or actually disappear? But in fact, what we're seeing is the opposite, that looking year by year in terms of reduction in risk of recurrence, you actually see improved benefits. So if you do what is called a piecewise hazard ratio by year, again, you see that hazard ratio is decreasing as we get further out, suggesting that there is maintained treatment benefit over time. And so we were all really excited uh, to see uh, in 2021 the FDA approval for a bemocyclob in the adjuvant setting. The approval, however, was restricted to those patients who met the high-risk eligibility criteria in Monarchy, so four or more positive nodes or one to three nodes with a tumor over five centimeters or high grade, but you also had to have a KI-67 greater than or equal to 20% in order to meet the indication set by the FDA for use of a bemocyclin. I think a little, uh, many of us were a bit puzzled uh, by this indication because in truth now, when you look at the data from Monarchy, you can see that the benefit in cohort one, so remember cohort one did not require KI-67 for eligibility. When you actually look at this particular cohort and you look at the outcomes in this group, you see that there's a 32% relative risk reduction for invasive disease-free survival events with an absolute difference between the two arms of about 6%, suggesting even when you just look at the patients who met eligibility by high clinical pathologic risk features without KI-67, there is benefit. 
And importantly, you're seeing this improvement in reducing distant events, predominantly reducing bone, liver, and lung metastases, which I think is particularly critical because these are the metastatic events that we know can impact survival. And so I think one of the challenges that has come up is this recommendation by the FDA to utilize KI-67 to guide our treatment decisions. And so I'll get into some of the reasons I'm a bit perplexed by this and some of the challenges with the use of KI-67. But before I dig into that, I thought I'd turn to Elahe to tell us kind of what um, her general practice is and whether or not KI-67 is something that you've been incorporating when selecting patients for use of abemacyclib. Um, in, in our setting, um, as you are aware, Sarah, Dana Farber, um, we do value KI-67. I, I think that it does have a value understanding the, um, the, uh, the risk. Um, however, um, we really do not look into KI-67 when we are making decisions about our patients. Of course, every patient is unique and we have to standardize that concept for every single individual, but mostly we go about cohort one um, as Monarch E uh, was um, included in patients who are very high risk. Um, KI-67 can play a role in our final decision, but it will not be the um, main decision of our uh, treatment. And I, I think that's critical that, you know, as, as you know, we're not really utilizing K67 routinely at, at our center. And I think um, some of the reasons for this uh, are important to think about. So I think firstly, why do you think it, it was that I think the FDA decided to make this decision? I Personally, I think that one of the factors that came into the FDA's decision was that they asked for a look a preliminary look at overall survival. This was not a pre-planned analysis to look at survival outcomes, but they did ask for these data. And what you see is at 27 months of follow-up, there's no difference in overall survival. You see the curves are really right on top of each other um, in the ITT population. But when you look at those patients who had a KI-67 greater than or equal to 20%, you see a trend towards benefit favoring a bemacyclib in this high KI-67 population. Again, it's not statistically significant. This was not a pre-planned analysis, but there is a trend. And so I think part of the thought was that there was a um, trend towards survival and knowing that this agent has potential toxicity, they wanted to restrict it to the group with a trend to OS in that group. But my challenge with that is that we know that patients benefited from a bemacyclib irrespective of their KI-67. This is the IDFS and the high KI-67 uh, patients where again, you do see, uh, again, over a 30% reduction in IDFS events with in fact here a 6% delta between the two arms. But when you separate out benefit by low and high KI-67, you see that both the low and high KI-67 patients benefited from a bemacyclib. The absolute benefit is smaller in the low KI-67 group, so you see about 4.5% compared to about 7% in the high KI-67 patients, but you see both groups are benefiting. And I think, Elahe, to your point, this is really a reflection on the fact that KI-67 is a prognostic marker. So, you know, as you pointed out, it does, it is a, a marker that can help us understand prognosis for a patient. You see high KI-67 patients have more events, but it is not predictive for benefit to a bemacyclib because both low and high patients are benefiting. And my worry is, is that patients who have really high clinical pathologic risks, so someone who has multiple lymph nodes involved, if you actually looked at monarchy, most of those patients with four or more lymph nodes involved actually had a low KI-67. And so that means they wouldn't be eligible per the FDA indication to get a bemacyclib. And I worry that we're, with that indication, potentially you know, not allowing these patients to benefit from therapy where we know uh, from the analysis uh, that there was a benefit in this subgroup. My other challenge is that there's not great analytic validity or reproducibility of KI-67 with testing, particularly in the range of the approval, which is, you know, the approvals for a 20% cutoff, but we know per the International Working Group guidance that if you have a KI-67 between 5 and 30%, in fact, it's not very reproducible. And so our group, as you noted, Elahe, is not routinely testing KI-67 because of this challenge with reproducibility of the assay in this range. 
And so, you know, I think when ASCO and in fact NCCN looked at this, they felt that the indication could be broader. And in fact, their guidance recommends use really based on Monarchy's ITT population, which is how both LAA and I tend to practice in clinic uh, with just using the clinical pathologic risk features for selection of patients for abemacyclib. And we'll get into to a lot of this more, but I do think there are these really helpful uh, practice sort of guidance uh, that is online with these practice aids. And I think having these in clinic uh, can be uh, really helpful when utilizing abemacyclib. So next we'll turn to how we actually use shared decision-making in the clinic to really maximize adherence, persistence, and managing adverse events with abemacyclib. And so what do we mean when we think of um, adherence and persistence? Um, so Elihe, I'll, I'll turn this to you and um, you know, ask you what you think some of the key causes of non-adherence are in our clinic and you know, how they impact patient outcomes. Um, in, in our clinic, what we have started to do, which I think it has quite helped with management of side effects and adherence for our patients, is we do uh, teaching prior to the, for the patient when they start. Of course, we give handouts to them um, and incorporated um, their comorbidities. Some patients have comorbidities that can cause actually worsening of side effects of CDK4-6 inhibitors. And that is important to notify uh, the patient and watch for, especially the medications. For example, we have, you know, patients with diabetes who are on metformin and that can cause worsening of their diarrhea with the CDK4 inhibitions. Um, so those are the factors that we take on as well as cultural factors, as I said, Cultural is important. Dietary factors in different cultures are very different. Um, so making sure that um, we give them some understanding of when you start this medication, the dietary changes might have to change in their life um, for the first few months um, of taking this medication is important as well. And then follow-ups. I think it's important to know that um, we follow up with our patients um, two weeks after to make sure that they are um, taking care of the side effects, early uh, prevention of those side effects, as well as tolerating it fine. So um, education, expectations, and then follow-up is a key factor. I think it is really so important, Elia Hay, because as, as you point out, it does take time because you really need to understand what's going on in that patient's life, you know, what's going on with work, how they understand, you know, what their educational status is towards understanding a lot of these kind of health literacy issues, um, thinking about other medications, as you point out, uh, thinking about, you know, their family situation. All of these things are really so important when trying to think about how to help a patient with adherence. And so I think getting that history is particularly critical. And so I thought, you know, what we could do is maybe put this all into perspective because I think this does help um, really think about how we manage patients in the clinic and help with monitoring, help with thinking about ways to um, treat adverse events and help patients with adherence to therapy. So here's our, our first case to consider. So this is a 43-year-old premenopausal woman. She initially presented back in 2020 with a palpable right breast mass and on imaging was found to have a four centimeter mass. This was biopsied and consistent with an intermediate grade invasive lobular carcinoma that was hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative. She did have uh, evidence of axillary nodal uh, involvement uh, that was FNA and, and positive but fortunately had staging studies uh, that did not reveal any distant metastatic disease. So her provider had decided to take her to upfront surgery and she had a mastectomy and axillary node dissection. And she was found to have a 5.2 centimeter intermediate grade invasive lobular carcinoma with 13 lymph nodes involved. And again, was ER positive, PR positive, and HER2 negative. She underwent adjuvant systemic chemotherapy with anthracycline and taxane-based treatment and then adjuvant radiation therapy, and then comes into clinic to make decisions about other um, systemic treatment options. And so at that point, 
again, she was premenopausal, so she was started on ovarian suppression with an aromatase inhibitor. She was also recommended to receive adjuvant zolindronic acid with the thought being that that may also help prevent recurrence and potentially help her maintain her uh, bone density. And then it was decided to initiate adjuvant abemacyclib, uh, which was started at the uh, recommended dose at 150 milligrams twice daily, uh, dosed continuously. And so uh, initially she was found to have diarrhea um, and this was persistent, low-grade uh, diarrhea. She also had fatigue um, and had neutrophil counts that were a little lower than baseline, but not neutropenic. She comes into clinic saying that she's been taking breaks off of therapy um, because of the challenges that she's had with diarrhea and fatigue, um, but she's been adherent with the endocrine component of therapy. So she's been on the ovarian suppression and her aromatase inhibitor. And she does note that with these breaks, her symptoms have improved off of therapy. And so given her experience with the abemacyclib, she's been anxious about it. Um, she hasn't had any dose um, reduction, so she's remained at the 150 dose, but again, has not been very compliant with therapy because of the toxicities that she's experiencing. And so I think this brings up a lot of important issues here about how we can think about managing her side effects from therapy and what strategies we can take to help her be able to continue on abemacyclib but do much better with tolerability uh, on therapy. And so we'll circle back uh, to this case. Um, so in the interim, I advise you to think about how you would approach managing uh, this patient. Um, and what we'll do is show you some of the data about the toxicities from Monarchy uh, that may help you uh, make decisions regarding management. So here you can see the adverse event table from Monarchy. And what you see is one of the most common toxicities from abemacyclib is diarrhea, where you see that most patients have low-grade diarrhea with about 8% of patients experiencing grade 3, 4 diarrhea, but again, 80% of patients having any grade diarrhea. Other uh, side effects that are important to keep in mind include fatigue, where you see about 40% of patients have some level of fatigue. Um, and you know, while neutropenia is possible, it isn't quite as common as other CDK4-6 inhibitors that we've been used to using, for example, in the metastatic setting, like things like palbocyclob or ribocyclob, where those things tend to be more common. Here you can see about 20% of patients have grade three, four neutropenia, uh, where 80% of people uh, are not having high-grade uh, neutropenia. Other sort of um, adverse events that I think are of interest but are thankfully not as frequent include venous thromboembolic events. And so we'll circle back to this in our case discussions, but important to keep this in mind where you do see that risk of ETE is higher with the combination of endocrine therapy and abemacyclib compared to endocrine therapy alone. Uh, again, about a you know, two to 3% rate. And there's also about a 3% rate of interstitial lung disease. So important, again, to keep these in mind and we'll, we'll discuss these. Um, so, you know, overall, when we looked at quality of life and the impact of these adverse events on patients by patient reported outcomes, um, you know, overall, what we saw was that as, you know, the adverse events were consistent with what we knew from the metastatic setting. We were familiar with these issues about diarrhea, fatigue, and these uh, rarer toxicities of thromboembolic events as well as interstitial lung disease. But despite this, when looking at quality of life and patient reported outcomes, we saw that there was actually no difference between the arms when asking patients how bothered they were by side effects. And so I think this is important to keep in mind that despite these side effects, again, in a randomized trial, the quality of life really suggested that it was pretty similar between the two arms. One of the challenges that was seen in Monarchy was that there were more discontinuations of abemacyclib than, for example, you would see with endocrine therapy alone. So if you looked at, across the trial for how many patients discontinued abemacyclib for any reason, it was a little under 30%. And when you looked at what toxicities were driving the to discontinuations, 
it was the most common toxicity to lead to discontinuation was diarrhea. But what's really important to realize about the diarrhea is it occurs early and typically improves over time. So here, when you look at this bar graph, you see uh, when you look at diarrhea rates by month, you see again, the highest t rate of diarrhea is occurring in month one, but over time you see it really decreases and significantly decreases once you get outside of that initial three to four months, where you see in fact rates of abemocyclob discontinuation due to adverse events also really goes down outside that first three to four month period, which is also the time frame of which the GI toxicity um, really dramatically improves. So important to keep that in mind um, and, and also to discuss that uh, timeline with patients. And when we look specifically at factors that led to increased risk of treatment discontinuation, there were several factors that um, were associated with this. And here you can see age over 65. Enrollment, interestingly, in North America or Europe compared to other geographic regions, having a worse performance status, being postmenopausal as opposed to premenopausal, having lower risk disease, meaning one to three positive nodes as opposed to four or more positive nodes, and having more comorbidities. And I think a lot of this is sort of common sense, you know, having a worse performance status, having more medical issues. Um, you know, these are gonna be, being older, these are gonna be issues that can be associated with more discontinuation. Interestingly, having lower risk disease was associated with less discontinuation. So having four or more positive nodes meant that you were more likely to comply uh, with therapy, meaning it suggests that those patients um, may have a lower, sort of a higher threshold towards discontinuing therapy because of their high risk disease. Whereas if you have lower risk disease, maybe you're more apt to stop uh, because maybe your absolute benefit is a little bit less in that situation. Um, when we look at percents of patients who actually required a hold of their abemocyclob or a reduction, you can see it's about 70%, so pretty common to need a dose hold um, for therapy, and about 40% of patients had one or more dose reduction. So, you know, think that's almost half the patients in the study who dose modified, and I, I will turn to Ella Hay's experience with this soon, but I'd say that that's probably pretty common, my guess is, in, in her practice. So when you think about dose modifications, again, we're gonna circle back to this. Remember, starting dose is 150 twice daily. If you dose reduce one time, you go to 100 twice a day, and then the second dose reduction goes down to, to 50. Um, so, Ella, I'll turn to you because I think this is something you're very used to managing in clinic, but um, you know, how do you think about the management of diarrhea? And, and you know, maybe you can take us through um, sort of what you think about doing and, and what the criteria are for dose modification, use of anti-diarrheal um, agents, uh, and then dose reduction. Sure, so um, when I do the teaching with the patient about side effects, and especially the diarrhea, as we all know that most of 80% of patients did get diarrhea, but it is a grade one and two diarrhea it was mostly, so that means that it is manageable. If we do preventive method, that will be manageable. So what I do ask them first is what, what is their usual bowel movement? Because what is norm for them, it's, it's really important to know up front. If I have a patient who has comorbidities with you know, colitis or IBS or any of these symptoms, then I will know what I need to do to make sure that we prevent for that um, side effects to stay at their baseline and not get worse. So um, I tend to make sure that they have loperamide at home and um, educate them that it is important to use it with the first set of um, onset of their diarrhea. And you take two um, peels of loperamide with the first set of diarrhea and then after each one of them one pill for the max of really eight pills. And what I try to make them understand is that the concept of eight pills of loperamide max is to make sure that your provider knows how many stools are you having per day. Because if you are having that much amount of stools, that means more than four stools per day with the use of loperamide, that means that you need something 
more to control or we need to hold the treatment. I also make sure that they understand what is, you know, normal to call for in stools. So, for example, if somebody has um, diarrhea in their routine life and they have like one or two set of uh, um, very loose stools on a daily basis, I don't count that. I basically say, if you have now four more, then you need to make sure that we actually communicate this. Um, and of course, the grading of this is important when we want to modify the dosage or hold. And as you can see, you know, with our mostly grade one, and that is a stool up to four, we really don't do anything right. We don't do any most uh, dose modification. And when we're looking at grade two, it's basically having between four to seven diarrheas, but it slightly started to... Um, uh, complicate your daily activity so you don't want to leave the house and that's where the intervention should come in and of course with gate three and four we we take it very seriously because at that time most of the patients have dehydration electrolyte imbalance and we need to make sure that we follow those in an inpatient setting as well well thanks Ella Hay for that outstanding overview of how to think about managing diarrhea and you know, I think um, just as you pointed out, it's so critical to get a good history from a patient for um, what their stools are like at baseline and then how that's been impacted uh, by the abemocyclib and then managing it based on that. And um, so, you know, really for grade two, um, we're not, um, we're usually just holding the abemocyclib and seeing if it improves. And then uh, if it improves quickly, we can resume at the same dose, but usually it takes more than 24 hours to improve. And so for most of those patients where it takes a bit longer, then we're um, thinking about dose modification. So from going from that 150 to 100 milligram dose, uh, once they improve back down to grade one, uh, then you can restart. Um, and grade two, again, you do want to suspend until it comes to grade one and then um, resume at a lower dose. With grade three, four, again, you want to hold um, and think about uh, dose reduction once they're uh, better uh, from that uh, incidence of diarrhea. So. Um, how do you think about monitoring these patients? So I think Elahe, you did a, an outstanding job about thinking about how to counsel them and think about um, holding or dose modifying the uh, abemocycle for the diarrhea. But what about, what schedule are you having your patients come back into clinic? What labs are you checking? Uh, how often are you seeing them? Um, maybe you can give us a, some suggestions for that type of monitoring. Um, sure. So for our patients who start on um, abemocycla, what we tend to do for the first two months, we monitor them quite um, frequently every two weeks with full set panel of blood work. That includes complete uh, CBC counts with differential as well as complete comprehensive um, chemistry. Uh, we want to make sure that we look at their white blood cells. We want to make sure that we um, look at their um, electrolytes as well as liver enzymes um, and their creatinine levels. Um, and we do that every two weeks for the first two months. Once they are actually stable and they're doing well, what we can do is that we do it on a monthly basis for the next two to four months. And it all depends after that. Every individual provider is different. But if you have a patient who's doing well after the four months starting of Club, we can totally um, delay the process of bringing them back on an every two weeks basis or every month basis and um, extend the duration of it to every two months. And again, it all depends on patients' overall uh, characteristics and their age, their comorbidities, um, and uh, that's usually how we um, start following the patient. So very um, strict upfront up to the first two to four months, and then later on we can um, decide according how they are actually tolerating it. Yeah, no, that's great and super helpful. And I think just as you point out, so critical to be getting those labs up front, uh, making sure they're not neutropenic, they don't have elevated LOTs, you know, all those things are important. And, and I sort of like that we see them back that regularly because it helps you better understand how they're doing in terms of their other symptoms like the fatigue and diarrhea. And so I, I think it's really helpful to, to have that built in. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit 
about some of the strategies that you think about for optimizing adherence and persistence when you're counseling someone on use of oral medication. You know, sometimes while it's much harder on patients to come in for IV therapy, the, what, the flip side of it is if you know that the patient got the drug and it, it was delivered on schedule, whereas with oral therapy, the thing that often makes me nervous is, you know, what is the patient actually doing at home and, and how are they handling it? And, and so really important to, to think about counseling uh, with this in, in particular. That's a great question, Sarah. Um, I think one of the best way to um, strategies um, in optimizing the adherence for oral therapy is um, making sure that we have a record of their intake. So if you, you know, you're familiar with our researches, in our research what we always do is that we give a printout of, uh, to patients to actually time in the times that they take their medications. And that's really a good record to have and a good way of knowing that patients are taking the medications. So I tend to print out an oral um, therapy checklist with the times on it and the days of the week and I ask them to actually either fill it in or just put a check mark when actually they are taking the medications. So that's one way to follow up on patients to make sure that they are taking it. Of course, pharmacy is um, another aspect. If I don't hear that patients are needing any refills on their medications, I call up the pharmacy and try to figure out what is going on and whether the patient is not taking it or not. And again, as we discussed, this is all multifactorial. So you have older patients, comorbidities, cultural, socioeconomic status, all can factor into this equation. Yeah, no, I think that's super helpful um, because, you know, I think it's so critical to, again, understand what's going on in that patient's life, think about ways that um, they can help monitor how often they're taking drug, um, whether it's, you know, writing it down or now people have all these fancy devices on their phones, uh, you know, to keep track of, of taking medication. And, you know, we're so fortunate at our institution that our pharmacists will do a check-in um, to um, look at adherence with oral therapies and see, counsel them on potential toxicities of drugs and see if they're experiencing any. And it's nice to have that initial um, check in with these oral drugs. Um, and so I think, you know, really important, um, you know, particularly with these agents. And so now circling back to the case after hearing all that data from Monarchy, and we discussed this young woman who had a high risk hormone receptor positive cancer who had started on a bemocyclic but was really struggling quite a bit with having diarrhea and fatigue and had you know, sort of decided herself to take these breaks off therapy and noticed that with the break, her symptoms actually did get a lot better. Uh, but you know, given her experience, was pretty anxious uh, about restarting the bemocyclib um, given her symptoms. And so how do you think about this, if, this patient, Elahe? If you were seeing her in clinic, what would you think about to help her through her side effects with the abemacyclib and then thinking about ways that could improve her adherence to the drug? Um, I would start with taking a history of what her dietary intake is, one, because that I think that is important to, um, to notice what patients are eating that making them actually have worsening of their diarrhea. Second, I want to know what preventive measures she took. In this, uh, in this case study, it does not look like she did use any loperamide. So I would definitely educate the patient about the use of loperamide um, in preventative for worsening of her diarrhea. Um, and I think that will help the patients to um, decrease their anxiety and give them the option that there is something we can do to make the diarrhea better. Uh, no, I think that's so critical. And I, I think here the details are really critical, as you point out, because we're not really understanding how bad is the diarrhea, how many times a day is she actually having bowel movements, is it low-grade diarrhea, is it high-grade diarrhea, what did she do, as you point out, with loperamide, did she, what were her dietary um, you know, factors that could have contributed, and so I think we need a little more information here to understand the, the sort of grade of the diarrhea. Um, but, you know, I think if it were, as, as you're pointing out, if it were a higher grade diarrhea, obviously she needed time off to get it better, which she did. Um, and then when it's better, I think the question is, did she need dose modification? And, you know, given the combination of the fatigue and the diarrhea, I think 
probably dose modification here may be reasonable uh, to go from 150 to 100. Again, almost half the patients in Monarchy did require dose modification, so that's not unusual. And personally, I don't know how you feel, Elahe, but I find that that dose modification makes a big difference. That change from 150 to 100 really is quite impactful. It really does, it really does. And I think one of the biggest challenges have been um, when you talk about dose modification, the immediate response from patients, but is it gonna help my cancer? Um, so um, I think it's important to review the data with them that yes, most of the patient, as you mentioned, Sarah, in the data that we have, they're all had dose modification and that can be, um, and one of the reasons that patients do not want to tell us about their diarrhea and side effects because they don't want to have that dose modification. So again, we go back to the same thing. Education is a key factor for our patients. Yeah, so, so true. That question does come up all the time is what's the impact on efficacy with that dose modification and you know technically we don't have the data from monarchy looking at outcome by dose we do have that in the metastatic setting where it really looked identical um, in terms of progression free survival but as you point out since over 40 percent of people dose modified anyway and the results look as good as they do it suggests that um, it's unlikely that dose modification is truly going to be impacting efficacy so really important to counsel your patients on that so that they understand it's okay to do uh, and is very, you know, quite common actually to need to do with this drug. And then as you point out, talking about use of uh, lopiramide as needed in the event that she wasn't doing it, hopefully would help her with the diarrhea. And my guess is the dose modification will help with the fatigue. Uh, and so I think, you know, my, my hope is that these changes um, will, will help her. And then as you point out the dietary counseling, you know, Eating a big salad, for example, on a bevacyclic can be pretty tough on the gut. And so high fiber um, it can be difficult. And so when you're just kind of getting used to it, I, I tend to tell patients to, you know, follow more of a brat kind of diet, a little bit more heavy on the carbohydrates tends to go well on the gut uh, and let things kind of settle before going back to, you know, more fiber rich foods. So those, those things can definitely help. Um, so maybe we'll turn to our next case. So this is a 48-year-old patient who's being treated with adjuvant bemacyclib. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we do worry about is risk of thromboembolic events. And so again, we're going to circle back to this, but when thinking about your endocrine agent, whether it's tamoxifen or abemacyclib, this can be an important factor. Um, and knowing that thromboembolic events can occur with combination therapy is, is important. Uh, and we'll circle um, to these issues about is there an indication for prophylaxis and how do you actually manage uh, clots um, if they occur with a BEMA. So here you can just see the data where you see that, again, as we pointed out, about 2.4% of patients can have a venous thromboembolic event. But what's really important is that this rate is higher with tamoxifen compared to an aromatase inhibitor. So you see about a 4% rate with tamabema compared to a little under 2% with an AI. Um, and so really it is important to realize that that tamoxifen combination is associated with higher rate of VTE. And so what do you do if a VTE occurs? In the trial on Monarch E, they did hold a bemacyclib in the setting of a clot. Uh, patients should undergo anticoagulation as would be routinely recommended for a thromboembolic event. But once clinically stable on that anticoagulation, you were allowed to resume the abemacyclib. Uh, and as long as you were anticoagulated through the duration of the abemacyclib, you were allowed to um, restart it. And so that is important to keep in mind as long as someone's clinically stable and appropriately treated. So. We'll come back now to thinking about this. And so, you know, for the first part of it, in terms of thinking about the endocrine partner, I'll be honest, I'm a little weary of giving tamoxifen with a bemacyclib due to that risk of VTE. And so personally, when making decisions, I tend to use an aromatase inhibitor. And for our premenopausal patients, these are high-risk patients. And so in truth, we have data from studies like SOFT and TECH suggesting that ovarian suppression and AI, in fact, is superior in the high-risk population to ovarian suppression tamoxifen. And so typically I'm using the aromatase inhibitor anyway, but you know, every once in a while 
I'm sure, Elihe, you can tell us about patients who don't tolerate AIs and you want to go to tamoxifen and, and then you're stuck. And so you think about, you know, doing that. So I, or does that happen to you where occasionally you have had to use tamoxifen with the bemocyclin? Um, I actually have not. Um, and we, as you said, we tend to use aromatase inhibitor a lot with this due to um, the possibility of BTEs. Um, and most of our patients are very high risk, right? Um, individuals, young um, women who we already have them on ovarian suppression. So for, for them, they already have the side effects. And um, because they are at higher risk, they tend to do whatever we tell them and they tend to not really focus too much on their side effects um, because they're worried. They're worried that if they don't do the right thing, their cancer is going to come back. So I think those patient populations, we, we truly don't see any um, significant um, side effects that will actually defer us on AI and switch them to tamoxifen. I personally have not had that happen. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting that you point that out in the analysis from Monarchy. They did find that patients who had higher risk disease were a little less likely to discontinue therapy. And I think, again, it just speaks to the threshold for, you know, patients dealing with side effects based on risk. And unfortunately, you know, understanding the risk, sometimes they're willing to put up with some side effects. But obviously, we wish they didn't have to, to deal with that. And we do want to try to mitigate risk of VTE as much as we can, because sometimes it can be serious, you know, developing a pulmonary embolism, for example, we'd love to avoid. And so I think it comes up, you know, if you're going to use tamoxifen for whatever reasons, you know, I had a, actually a male breast cancer patient a few months ago that I wanted to give tamoxifen to, so he didn't have to have Lupron. And... Um, I was worried he was older about risk of VTE with tamoxifen and abema. And, you know, I did discuss it with hematology. And in the end, I'll be honest, we did decide to put him on anticoagulation with the tamoxifen and abema because he was at high risk for clot from the get-go given his age and high risk cancer. So, you know, I think discussion with the hematologist if someone has other risk factors for clot and is going to do tamabema is probably a, a good thing to, to consider. Um, so how about a, another case? This is a 52-year-old patient with hormone receptor positive disease who's on uh, an aromatase inhibitor and a bemocyclib. And, you know, just LA, as you recommended, they come in, they get their blood count checked at week two, um, and you've ordered your CBC and comprehensive metabolic panel, and you see that their creatinine's elevated. So what do you think about this? What's going on, and why are you seeing that elevated creatinine? Um, yes, we do see that elevated creatinine, and it's all due to dehydration. And, you know, patient having the diarrhea, they're getting really dehydrated and not hydrating enough themselves or not using the anti-diarrhea medication. In these settings, we tend to stop the abemocyclob. We hydrate patients, and um, I tend to recheck their labs a week after before I start them back on the abemocyclob. Um, also, we make sure that they don't have any underlying condition. You know, some of our um, uh, high-risk population uh, can have other comorbidities that can elevate their creatinine level, um, and we want to make sure about that as well. But we tend to stop, make sure the labs are back to normal before we start them. I have not had anybody with a very high creatinine that was not corrected by taking care of their diarrhea and hydration for us to dose reduce them. Again, it all goes hand to hand, right? So if the diarrhea is grade two and above and we hold it, the patient's still not doing well on the anti-diarrhea medication. That's when we think about dose reduction to make sure that we manage all of these symptoms. So I think it's certainly so critical to make sure we think about a differential diagnosis when we see that elevated creatinine. Certainly, um, you know, a bemocyclob can lead to diarrhea, which can lead to dehydration and make them look pre-renal. I think another thing to keep in mind, though, is that one tricky thing with a bema is it actually impairs the excretion of creatinine from the renal transporters. So in fact, it can cause a falsely elevated creatinine which is super tricky um, when differentiating, you know, as you're pointing out, the dehydration, which we can see from diarrhea, from just a falsely elevated creatinine from the abema alone. And so I actually tend to test a cystatin C, which isn't impacted by the abemocyclib. And so you can actually evaluate their GFR 
and see, was it a full salivation? You know, maybe let's say, oh, hey, you hydrated them and it didn't correct. Mm -hmm. You know, then I'd be worried that this is just a false elevation of their creatinine. And so I just tend to check the Systat and see. And once I've checked it a couple times, you know, over a month or so, and I see that it's always elevated, uh, their creatinine's always elevated, but their GFR is normal, then you know this is due to the issue of abema impacting the transporters. Uh, and so important to realize that this can happen, that it, it, you know, you can just get a false elevation of creatinine and a cystatin C can help you differentiate if they're really prerenal or if it's just that false elevation. That's a great point, Sarah. I think one of the key factors is most of the time when they come in with high elevation and no diarrhea, that's where I, uh, yeah. I start thinking about my differential diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah, so obviously it's so important to understand what's going on with the patient and, and why it could be. Um, but if you're getting a little confused, because I, I, again, we do see this, that, you know, they're, they're fine, there's no issues, but their creatinine's up, I uh, realize that this certainly can happen. And important to counsel the patient on, because I've seen patients look at their labs and get a bit alarmed as well from this issue with abema. So, you know, I think that was a, an excellent overview of um, some of the challenges that we have in the adjuvant setting, but I'll turn back to you, Ella Hay. Are there any other important tips that you think are important for providers to be aware of, given all your experience with the Bemacyclob, uh, that can help uh, with keeping uh, patients on treatment uh, and improving adherence, um, but also appropriately managing their adverse events? I think as we all talked about um, all through this session, um, getting a clear um, educational materials for them, expectations, a full history um, for, from that patient, involving the patient's family members, involving the um, cultural background um, of that patient. It is important. So it's not one. I think it's multifactorial, and we have to look at it with that lenses, that it is multifactorial. And spend the time. I think what we need to really understand is that we need to sit down with our patient and spend the time to educate through them. It is difficult for a patient who has a high risk, and we are adding another factor for their treatment that can actually cause changes in their quality of life and also make sure that they have other resources available dietitian to be available for them refer them to dietitian refer them to any other aspect of meditation exercise those are important factors that we need to contribute when we are talking about these side effects and quality of life no, I think it's so critical, and I think what you point out is it, it does take time, you know, getting to understand details about what's going on with the patient, why they're having challenges, what their exact symptoms are, how we can help them through it. And, and that is really critical because, you know, this drug is reducing risk of recurrence, you know, relatively by over 30%, uh, and it can prevent distant events, which, you know, can prevent metastatic disease for that patient, which obviously would have a huge impact on their life expectancy and quality of life. And so doing what we can to prevent that, I think is so critical. Uh, and so doing all that we can to help them um, stay on the medication is, is really important. Um, and so I think your, your tips about um, you know, managing the diarrhea, the fatigue, uh, thinking about these unusual uh, toxicities like uh, thromboembolic events is really critical. I think another one that we didn't touch so much on um, was risk of interstitial lung disease, which is really rare, um, but you know important to, to keep in the back of our minds. And so I think knowing uh, all this uh, about potential side effects, it's important to have um, tools um, that can help you with managing patients. And there are these great practice aids that are available online. So do feel free to download them um, if helpful for you and, and your practice. Um, so I think just uh, in summary, I think some key takeaways are, it's really important to realize which patients are candidates for abemacyclib. And as we talked about, based on the monarchy data, really it would be those patients who would have met the who would have met the criteria for eligibility for that trial. So someone, for example, had four or more positive nodes, had one to three positive nodes, and a tumor over five centimeters or high grade. These are patients that would have met eligibility for monarchy, and those are patients that I do consider for use of abemacyclib. 
Certainly if you're someone who does utilize Ki67, it can also be considered um, if they're greater than or equal to 20%. Um, you know, that is another factor that is associated prognostically with higher risk disease. So again, critical to important to identify the right patients who are candidates for therapy. And then when utilizing it, again, remember Abema is used uh, for the first two years of their adjuvant endocrine therapy. That 150 milligram twice daily dose is a continuous dose. Um, and you know, important to think about the potential side effects as we discussed, like fatigue, diarrhea, um, and then the rare toxicities like um, thromboembolic events or ILD and to make sure you're familiar with managing those side effects um, so that you can help patients uh, tolerate therapy well and, and help with adherence uh, through their course of their treatment. So thank you so much, Elahe, for joining me today in this discussion. It was great to get your uh, pearls of wisdom on managing uh, patients uh, with the Club. Certainly have a ton of experience, so great to learn so much from you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash VMP860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Lilly.